Welcome everybody to Dead Talk Live. I am your host Viz and today we are joined by Damon Thomas who is the director of the new movie called My Best Friend's Exorcism which is available today on Amazon Prime Video. Damon, thank you so much for joining us. How are you doing? I'm doing very well, thank you. Uh, so nice to be here. Uh, it is a pleasure to talk with you. I saw this film uh, within the last several days, and just like I told you, we went live. I really enjoyed it. Uh, lighthearted horror, it's creepy, but lighthearted and a lot of fun elements to it. So we'll break it down. But this is an adaptation from Grady Hendrick's novel that was written into a screenplay by Jenna Lamia. At which point did you get involved in this project? Uh, I got sent the script back in 2019. So um, so I hadn't read the book then. So that was my introduction to Grady Hendrix, was the script, the adaptation. And uh, to be honest with you, I just love the title. It's just one of the best titles there is. You know, My Best Friend's Exorcism, the kind of, you know what you're getting involved in. Yeah. So, uh, um, and then I really enjoyed... The setting of the 80s um and uh, i really liked the friendship story i liked that that it was a story of friendship and how friendship triumphs so uh, all wrapped up in a demonic possession of course of course you know you gotta add that twist now when it comes to directing which you have done a lot of uh when it comes to source material when you come in as a director do you let the source material affect you? Do you go to it as a sort of a reference point or do you sort of kind of push it out of your mind and see your own vision for the project? I suppose as a director, the script is the script. And so mm -hmm. that is your primary focus. Uh, I was obviously just interested to read the book and see how, you know, uh, who the characters were, whether the same and how the story had sort of, deviated i think adapt when you do an adaptation it becomes its own animal mm -hmm. it becomes it starts its own life and uh you know that may be frustrating for purists about the book as with all adaptations um but in the end you are making a movie and yeah. that it, you know a movie has to sort of deliver certain things especially when you're making it for you know amazon they they want a certain kind of movie uh, obviously, I have a big influence, and obviously uh, on how it's made and the tone of it. Um, but those are constant and evolving discussions that start right from the beginning. Exactly. And uh, and, and then there are so many other factors that um, that come into play when you're making a movie. You, you're, you're just presented with so many sort of roadblocks on the way that you sort of have to navigate and be sort of you know light of foot about. Uh, uh, and at yeah. the end of the day, the screenplay takes a life of its own, you know, and, and I think that's great. Yeah, yeah. It, it, it really is true. And, uh, you know, it, sometimes it, sometimes with genre, it's a very interesting thing in that uh, there's certain people that kind of go, oh, it's not scary enough or it's not like this. But in a way, say, The Exorcist is like the benchmark. So, mm -hmm. you know... Um, so it's kind of there are tropes so you either sort of embrace the tropes or you sort of reject them and the thing is you don't want to just make a carbon copy of another movie do no. you? you don't you're trying to you know so i think these days we're so film literate so that you know you'll start watching a drama a movie a tv series and you'll go those two people will get together yeah. that guy he's the evil one he's going to turn bad and that guy's <laughs> going to get killed. <laughs> you, you, i know exactly you know, what you're talking you're, about yeah yeah that happens with me and my wife when we're on the couch watching a television show you know you can sort of predict how it's gonna go now you you mentioned the film is set in the 80s but the 80s is not detrimental to the story itself were there any discussions to modernizing the film to today modern day uh no no um do you know what, though? I think that, that setting it in the 80s, which the book is set in the 80s, it kind of, uh, you know, it takes out of, you You don't have to have information carried through mobile phones. Anything now set in modern day, mm -hmm. half the time is people being on the phone, seeing phone screens. 
And also we are, we have access to so much more information. I mean, yeah. back in the 80s, we, you know, I lived through that day. It was a big decade in my life. And uh, you, uh, you, you know, like even finding out about music, there were like dedicated shows. There was the radio, which is so important. You used to like record off the radio to hear your favorite yeah. song. Mixtapes. Yeah, tapes. You could never find any information. You either had to have join a fan club if there one existed. And you sort of just had these tiny little moments. And it was a bit like all information about anything. And I think it sort of, it, it, it kind of uh, highlights, you know, in the film, each of the characters has a kind of issue of like either body image. I think if it was set now, we would have to frame it with all the open discussion that really happens now. Exactly. <laughs> You know, and it think, and sometimes that's interesting is to remember where we've come from, what's what what life was like, you know, forty years ago and, and, and thirty five years ago. And showing it to today's generation. This is what life was like 40 years ago. Now, I have to ask you this question. In the opening few minutes of the film, there is a reference made to Boy George from the from the group uh, Culture Club, uh, where one of the girls has a crush on Boy George. And it's sort of that little little nuggets throughout the whole film that really take us back for those of us that lived through the 80s. Um, what'd you think of that part with the whole Boy George crush thing? What I did after I immediately saw that, I paused the film and I sort of surveyed the, the women who were, you know, lived through the 80s. I'm like, did you have a crush on Boy George or know anybody? Another girl who had a crush on Boy George. Uh, what did you think when you read that that little bit of the script? Um, well, the thing is, you know, when Boy George uh, kind of first appears, he caused a huge stir, much in the same way that David Bowie mm -hmm. caused a huge stir when he first appeared on Top of the Pops. Yeah, uh, People were scandalized by the fact that when David Bowie leant against his guitar player and kind of rubbed shoulders with him. People were like, oh my God, what are we looking at? Yeah. And we, think, we, we feel that as like nothing now, would we? We wouldn't no. even bat an eyelid to that. And I think the thing about when Boy George first, it was like, is he a boy? Is he a girl? He's so exciting. It just felt like a new frontier. Exactly. And we sort of forget. The, and that's why it's really interesting when you, like you were saying before, just looking back, you know, things were different. Weren't they? They were. They were really different, and we, we, we're we're still evolving, aren't we? All the time, you know. Sexuality is such a complicated and ever evolving conversation. And back there, it was everything was much more simple. I mean, people just kind of lived quite more straightforwardly, and you really didn't have any discussions about no, things no. to do with sexuality, emotions. You know, people used to make jokes about men talking about emotions. Exactly. And, and, and I think that it's it's kind of interesting, and that's one of the. Uh, it allows you to sort of simplify things because otherwise now it'd be such a complicated mm -hmm. kind of conversation that it would be hard to focus in on their individual stories. Absolutely. Uh, so let's focus in on some elements of the film. The owl. The owl <laughs> is seen a lot throughout the film. Not only the bird, drugs. Uh, for you, what did the owl represent? Well, it's, just, it's the uh, symbol of Andras, the demon. That's his symbol. That's okay. what symbolizes it. That's it. So it's just a kind of nod and to ha have a presence that his, when he's near, his influence is near, that you see more owls. And that was, that was just a way that we kind of brought that story in. And when you integrated it into that little scene with the uh, drugs, uh, is that also sort of like a little... <laughs> little easter egg that you know yeah don't do drugs yeah. you know nancy yeah, reagan at exactly. the time yeah, yeah. It's, it's like it's like yeah where, the, where is the tendrils of his influence moving into you know exactly now elsie fisher and amaya miller play the two leads they really captured the the time period um what was your experience directing them? These are not new faces to the screen. They have been acting for a long, long time. So what was your experience with those two girls? Oh, fantastic. Um, uh, sort of, uh, Elsie was, uh, you know, 
top of our list for Abby right from the get-go. Um, I'd really loved her in eighth grade and thought her naturalism was just fantastic. And then um, we went on a search for, uh, you know, Gretchen. And actually, Amaya came in quite late into yeah. that search. And uh, I did it, of course, it was in the pandemic, so everything was done like this virtually. Yeah. And she sort of scared me, actually, when she did. <laughs> when she did, I got her to do an extract from the exorcism. And she just <laughs> totally went for it. And I was like, uh, going, wow. Uh, and so we um, did a chemistry read on Zoom with, uh, with Elsie. And that we thought, you know, I thought they worked really well together. So that was great. Then we sort of expanded out for them. As in terms of working with them, they're just professionals. You know, they're great to work with. They're generous. They're fun. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, you know, they, they like the, all four of them just became friends as, as they sort of, you know, the movie went along, which is really fantastic to see. And that um, chemistry between Abby and Gretchen, if that doesn't work, the film doesn't work. So yeah. obviously as a director, that was very, very important for you. How difficult, I mean, you told us how Gretchen, you know, you saw her and she just captivated you. Well, did you go through a lot of people before yeah. you find your huge. you found your Gretchen? Yeah, yeah, huge. Yeah, okay. You, I mean, everyone these days, because uh, the pandemic, but the, the modern way now is that everyone self tapes. So, yeah, saw a lot, you know, and okay. and also for uh, Christian Lemon, you know, the Chris Lowell. Yeah, the song. because that part just you have to have kind of comedy bones. Mm -hmm. You have to know how to do that role and he just knew how to do it and um yeah so let's talk about the the lemon brothers okay yeah. <laughs> very fun traveling christian fitness motivational speakers yeah. i guess is a way to summarize them um was there a particular way that you wanted to develop those three brothers their relationship well i mean uh, first off, there were there were powerlifting kind of like religious weightlifters in the eighties. It was a thing. They would do tours and they would lift weights for the Lord, and uh, it was a thing. You know, if you go on YouTube and just put that in the search engine, you will find them. And um, uh, so they were a bit more small. To, I mean, some of those people toured kind of very big spaces, mm -hmm. and so that we scaled them down, made them a little, probably a little bit sadder with kind of not very good fireworks and uh, they please, you know, every, everyone's living the dream, aren't they? You know, oh, you I, th I thought the concrete <laughs> on the chest was pretty dramatic. <laughs> yeah, it was good, right? <laughs> Definitely. And so I think that uh, one of the things I encouraged uh, Jenna to do was to make him a bit more three-dimensional as a character so that we, when he did the exorcism, he, you know, his joy at making it happen partially was a real joy and you really feel that from him you know when he goes yes he has that moment and it, and it's a it's a, what i like about it what i'm really interested in is the juxtaposition between you know like the horror and then just the comedy the relief right next to it yeah uh, it's something he did in we you know in killing eve and dracula um and uh so it was just to kind of make him 3d that he was bullied by his brothers yeah and you know, he was desperate to prove himself. And find his and own identity. Exactly. And so that, you know, when he, she, and, you know, and just, um, I just had this, I just really wanted to see this image of him bringing the cross down in the mall on, an, on the escalators. <laughs> and, that was awesome. And, that, and uh, he just brought it alive by just finger drumming on it, the cross, as he's coming down the escalators, <laughs> sort of doing a little song to himself. And, you know, that is very, I think the thing about tone, and some people may disagree, but uh, it's all about truth. If you create a three-dimensional character, if they're true to themselves, yeah. even if that character is a strong flavor, for me, that's when it works. Mm -hmm. It's when you start giving people just gags that you could go, oh, I can give that, I can give that line to that other, the other character and it still works. And then you sort of think, well, it's got to be work just for them. Then we know we've got the character right. Absolutely. And I think that that, and I think that, you know, for me, you, you, <laughs> it, you know, uh, uh, I, it, it, 
I could have just done, yeah, you know, people go, well, it's not scary enough. But the thing is, we've got brilliant. We've got The Exorcist. We've got a lot of films oh. that deal with exorcisms and they're dark and they're scary. And I thought like, you know, we haven't had one which has this tone. And the thing is, you sort of get criticized for doing something that's different uh, or not. You know, people kind of go with you and go like, this is great. Yeah. Um, but some people go, like, well, why is it just really serious? It's like, well, there's quite a lot of those films. This is what this one is. This is just exactly. different. Exactly. You got to see it for what it is, what, what it's meant to be. Let's talk a little bit about the satire uh yeah. versus reality now i totally see today's youth generation looking at this uh you know and looking at the 80s portrayed through this film and saying wow this is funny way off into the scent satire universe but the reality is there is satire here but a lot of it is was pretty true for what the 80s was like um so when yeah. people ask you like I'm about to and other people are going to ask you as the days roll on about the satire aspect, uh, what are your thoughts? How much of it did you want to push over the line and to the really ridiculous funny in satire? And how much did you really want to capture the mindset of what it was like back in the 1980s? Yeah, I think I suppose it comes back to what I was just saying before about flavors of characters. Um, you know, I think we all have friends who are quite strong flavors, and so they kind of seem a bit larger than life. Um, but I think that uh, in terms of making commentary about the, the times, I think the script script does do that in the way that the language that is used, the way that the the the, the, the four girls talk talk to each other. Yeah. you know, right from the beginning. Um, people were quite blunt in those days. People just kind of said things and sort of, you know, nowadays we'd have much greater sensitivity. Mm -hmm. We would literally go, oh, I can't say that, I can't. Yeah. But people did say just quite rude things quite often. Yeah. Just because they, we didn't have a sophisticated emotional conversation that we do no. now, no. You, know, you know, like, Friend, friends now will talk about their emotions back then. I mean, especially guys. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was just only banter. That's that's, that's it. That's it. That exactly. was it. It was you know your your dad, my father. You know, you, you didn't have like you wouldn't sort of like break down and have a cry with you. That was, no, it was you know, um, and I think that it's just with those things I thought were quite truthful because I you know I was there and I remember certain conversations you used to have and you. You know, people were quite brutal with each other. Oh yeah, and and so I think that that is quite truthful about. Now you could sort of say, well, why don't you do it with a modern spin? But that's, in a way, that, that is not what this is about. This is no. set in the eighties. Otherwise, you're doing a completely different film. I mean, it's complete. That's not no. the book. So you might as well then not do an adaptation because that's not the book. So the book is those characters, you know, and the people watching this film today uh have to realize who d were not around when the internet was not around that your world back then was the people around you now literally the entire world can be your audience and yeah. that changes things dramatically abby is a very self-conscious girl do you think gretchen appreciates abby the way abby appreciates gretchen um well there, uh, there's dynamics in a group like there are in all friendship groups. So you have sort of two alpha characters, which are Gretchen and Margaret. But mm -hmm. Margaret's a sort of sporty alpha. She's the sort of, you know, quite blunt. And uh, Gretchen is the sort of, they sort of slightly vie for positions. And then they have their kind of wing, wing women who are sort of Glee and Abby, you know, sort of like, supporting this, the kind of power structure. Exactly. And I think that happens in real life within groups, doesn't it? It's a sort of true dynamic. Yeah. So I think that that was um, something that was sort of interesting. And again, I think sort of truthful. Um, you, and you know, one thing I think was really, I was really interested in, I was really interested in the friendship story. And I think that that's kind of something that's quite important now because, you know, since the pandemic, people have, you know, got sort of maybe uh, become less, more antisocial. 
Yeah, more and withdrawn, I, uh, introverted. And I think that friendship is actually really important for all mm -hmm. of us. And, you know, friend, in, in studies about happiness, one of the two things that come out is one is about friendship. Like, friends are great for you, really good for you. And being outdoors, if you can be outdoors with friends. Yeah. And I think that we do far less of both now. And if that kind of is one of the things I, I think people take away from the film is the friendship is important. And it will probably save the day for you. Exactly. At the end of the day, we're all we are social creatures. We're almost out of time, but I, I do have to ask you, and for the people to know that you have directed some very popular TV shows, uh, Killing Eve and yeah. Penny Dreadful. Now, for me, Penny Dreadful, I love both Killing Eve and Penny Dreadful. Penny Dreadful, I love that show. It has a really special place for me. You directed Fantastic. the next to last episode for for to the series finale. Uh, if you were to like compare Penny Dreadful, Killing Eve, in your career as a director, where do they sit for you? Uh, in terms of importance, or like what I don't, I you know, happened? some projects just have a special place in directors' hearts for one reason or another. You know, it, it, you know you. As a, as a career, you sort of, uh, you, as a director, you don't get offered all the projects in the world. Yeah. <laughs> you know, you kind of get set on a pathway and then suddenly things come into your orbit and people go, oh, he does that sort of like ghosty, sort of supernatural, maybe, you know, <laughs> it yeah. kind of comes your way. And John Logan, who wrote that, it was very beautifully written as a show and probably maybe a bit underappreciated. You know, it's sort of maybe not seen as mainstream. And I thought that, you know, Ava Green was phenomenal. Oh my just, God. Wasn't, and, and should have maybe been Emmy nominated in the first season. Um, so it was, it was great to work with such a great, you know, Hollywood writer as John. Um, and then to go on to a show like Killing Eve, which kind of had that Coen Brothers quality, but also represented a new kind of female character, which is, you know, men have often played amoral characters when yeah. they do really bad things, good things. But we still like them. And women haven't had, didn't, I didn't, and they do now. But yeah. Villanelle was just like, you know, she was assassin. <laughs> she regularly stepped over the line. <laughs> yeah. And I think that was such an exciting thing as a director to work one with Phoebe Waller Bridge and with Jodie and, you know, Sandra and, you know, Cap, you know Fiona Shaw. It, um, just to work with that caliber of actors with that kind of script. And I really like that tone. Oh, yeah. Um, so, which I took forward into things like Dracula. Uh, yeah. And, you know, you have to have, some people don't like that tone. They don't, they find it, they just want drama to be serious mm. or they want money yeah. to be funny. I mean, and it's just not their thing and it's quite divisive. Um, uh, and it's the same with genre, isn't it? So people go mm. like, well, it's not scary enough. Yeah. But I didn't want this, I didn't want this uh, My Best Friends Exorcism to be like suddenly go really super dark. Because I think I really wanted it to feel like a lost film from the 80s that you kind of, have, you know, stylistically, yeah. you know, if you look at something like Heathers, which is at the time, do you remember the, it was really dark, wasn't mm -hmm. it? Thought like, yeah. Oh my God, you know, what is he doing? And uh, if you actually rewatch it, it's quite straightforward in the way that it's shot. I mean, Christian uh, Slater's character in that, I mean, he was oh, labeled a psychopath, everything. Wasn't it? Yeah. We found, you know, it's, it's going back to those things like Boy George. We, it's hard to sort of make, you know, young people of today feel that reaction because it's, yeah. it's not their era. They won't feel that. And it's it's hard a totally to sort of different go. world. Yeah. I mean, it was a bit like talking to the cast about Ouija boards and yeah. about... We used to think they were quite spooky back in the 80s. If someone got the Ouija board out, we would sort of laugh and sort of try to pretend that we didn't find it scary. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And and that, so, but, but in reality, everybody was really just scared out of their wits. Yeah. They exactly. just wouldn't admit it. Yeah, exactly. So, um, you know, um, so getting back to the whole sort of career thing, you know, it's been great to, you know, I'm just... Things that come into my orbit, you know, I'm, all, I'm just always looking for just good writing. You're just looking for something that you can possibly make a little bit different to mm -hmm. what's gone before. Um, you know that it's going to divide taste. It, it, like, you know, how many, I mean, the, the internet has a million people with a billion viewpoints. So uh, all you can do is just try to do something that's interesting, maybe 
takes the genre somewhere a little bit new, which I think hopefully this does, you know, yeah. the Exorcist indeed. Um, you know, I'm really, it was great last night, we watched the premiere of it, it had like 300 people. And it was great to watch it with a whole group of people just responding in the way that you thought it should, you know, would happen, would love for it to happen, and it sort of did. And also to find things, or react to things you never thought people would react to so strongly. Yeah. And but, a um, lot, what a lot of people don't notice is the actual tone of, I'm, I'm not talking about story, the way it's filmed. Like, uh, my best friend's exorcism has a very light uh, tone that you put to it as a director with the lighting, except when they go into the woods where it's supposed to be scary and into that abandoned shack, and then it gets yeah. dark, and then it goes back to being bright, sunny, daylight. And that really affects, even though the, the viewer may not notice it, it affects how they perceive the overall tone and feeling of the movie. Yeah. And I think yeah. you did a brilliant job at it. And I mean, you're a great director. It's in your body uh, of work and all the shows, the movies you've done. This is a great film. I encourage everybody to watch it. It premiered today on Amazon Prime Video. It's available right now. It's called My Best Friend's Exorcism, directed by our guest here, Damon Thomas. Damon, I, wa Damon, I want to thank you so much for being our guest today. Do you have any final thoughts you want to share before we go? Well, thank you, Juan, for having me on. And thank you for your kind words. <laughs> uh, you're trying to make me blush. Um, and uh, I think one thing you were just talking about there, about light and the dark, is that, you know, with genre, there are like tropes, aren't there? Mm -hmm. There are things that you, like the, the double scare, like the first scare, the second scare, the yeah. jump scares, the, you know, uh, put your, putting your hands into the dark, the uh, the dark corridors. And I think that you, uh, that one as a director, you sort of either have to embrace them or you sort of reject them, you know, to try and do different things. But I think that was, you know, um, you know, where I, I was pleased that you pointed that out. Yeah, because it's all, it, it, it's blended in perfectly. The scenes that are meant to be dark are dark. And the other, when they're outside, it, it has that light tone. And... You know, you've seen other movies where they are outside, it is sunny outside, but it still has that dark tone to it. Yeah. And I think you did a brilliant job. Thank you so much for being on here with oh, us. I you. want to thank our audience, those who are tuning in live and those who will be watching this later on. Again, the movie's called My Best Friend's Exorcism, available right now on Amazon Prime Video. Damon, thank you. On behalf of Damon and myself, stay safe and stay walking. Bye-bye, everybody.